When we come to the end of the letters of Paul, or individual letters in Paul's body of literature, we often face a certain and specific temptation that is associated with the genre of letters. It doesn't present itself the same way when we're reading a gospel or some other ancient document that's in the canon of Scripture in the Bible. It's mainly with the letters. And this temptation is before us as we come to the end of the letter. And the temptation is the idea that it's okay to skip the end of the letter because, well, it seems kind of mundane and not very interesting and it feels really distant and we don't know who those people are anyway. We've already heard all the good stuff, haven't we? We've heard Paul's powerful statements about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. We've heard him declare the beauty of the person of Christ who is Lord over all things and who has offered His life for us. We've heard him tell us that our life is hid with Christ in God. And we've heard him call us not only to receive Jesus, but to continue to walk with him, to live in him, to draw near to him. We've heard him say that that means taking a very aggressive posture towards the problem of sin and rebellion, those things in our life that seek to rear their ugly heads and create distance between us and God. We've heard him say, hey, you got to put that to death. Kind of hard to hear sometimes, but it wasn't uninteresting when Paul starts talking about that kind of stuff. We've worked through these rich and robust aspects of the letter. We've heard him say that the gospel offers flourishing and that Jesus offers above all perfect love, unity in the Spirit. And so we get to the end and we're not sure what to do with them. We know it's a letter and he's got to tie up loose ends and offer his greetings and he's got these instructions and those people need to know what those other people are up to, but Tychicus, Epaphras, Aristarchus, what do we do with them? Who are they? What do they have to do with us? They lived 2,000 years ago. And so we're tempted just to think, well, you know, we've read the good stuff. Let's skip on over to 1 Thessalonians or Ephesians or something and get some more meat. The trouble is, God in His great wisdom has included in the inspired and authoritative canon of Scripture in the Bible these letters. Occasional letters written to individual people in very specific places, in a different language, on the other side of the world, in a different time, with different cultural assumptions. God, in His wisdom, instead of giving us some sort of theological treatise or some other book of church polity and practices, gave us a book that includes these letters. Wisdom would say, (laughs) we should pay attention to that. If God in His wisdom offers it to us, wouldn't it be wise for us to receive what He offers? Wouldn't it be wise for us to say, we may not understand it, but we know You do, Lord. So we're willing to linger here, even if it's a little awkward or difficult, or unclear. And we're going to trust that you have something to offer us as a means of grace. If we do that, we just might discover that Paul frequently uses the ends of his letter to put an exclamation point on some of the meaty, more important stuff we thought we've read read earlier. He often uses the end of his letter to offer a vision of what he hopes the gospel will accomplish. A lot of times it comes in the way those oddly named people relate to each other. Oftentimes the end of the letter letter tells us exactly what Paul thinks was the most important thing he'd said all along as he did his work planting churches and encouraging churches like the one in Colossae around the Mediterranean. And that, friends, is the case here. 
As we read together and dig in for the next few minutes these strange verses with strange names, we will find a resounding exhortation that captures up the heart of this letter and offers it to us and leaves us with a remembrance that this whole thing is about one thing. And it is that a Christ-oriented community will embody other-oriented love. That's the exclamation point at the end of Colossians. Now, how do we get there? Well, before we dig into those household codes, it's worth remembering the big picture structure of the letter. You may remember that the first command comes in chapter 2, verse 6. Paul said to the Colossians, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, Now continue to live your lives in Him. Everything up until that point was instruction, or excuse me, not instruction, but theology and kind of statements about who Jesus is and who God is and what Paul is up to. With verse 6, he switches to ethics. It's worth remembering that. And that one big commandment, continue in Him, continue to live in Him, then gets applied to different aspects of life. If you're going to continue to live in Him, you've got to be able to tell, out, tell who the false teachers are. So he talks about the false teaching. If you're going to continue to live in Him, you've got to be able to identify sin and rebellion and deal with that. So he talks about that. If you're going to continue in Him, you've got to grow in virtue. and You've got to put on love, which binds everything together in perfect unity. Those are individual expressions of this one big picture thing. Continue in Christ, major imperative. And everything else is how to apply that. When we get to this section with instructions for wives and husbands, children and fathers, slaves and masters, he's still offering instruction on how to continue in Christ. Now before we dig into the details on that, it's worth acknowledging that texts like this in the Bible have been used wrongly and interpreted poorly at times to keep people, sometimes especially women, in physically dangerous and harmful situations. There is no interpretation of the Bible that keeps people in dangerous, like physically dangerous, abusive relationships. We are sometimes called to put our lives on the line for the gospel, but remaining in a situation of physical abuse because somebody said the Bible told wives to submit to their husbands is the wrong interpretation of this text. What is the right interpretation of this text? Well, to get that, it helps if you know a little Latin. Probably no surprise there, right? In the first service, I asked if anyone had ever studied Latin as a child, and a surprising number of people raised their hand. I'm tempted to ask that here. Anybody? Not quite as many, but a few. So, you ready back there, Gordon? I saw your hand go up. Pop quiz time. In the Roman world, there was a principle, a a role in the family called, you ready for it? Two Latin words, pater, what's it mean? Anybody? Father, that's not that hard. The next one's even easier, you ready? Pater familias. I bet anybody can figure that one out. A little bit louder. Family, right? So familias. Cool thing about Latin is a lot of times you can take the last letter off and you've got the English right there in front of you. Pater familias is the father of the family or the head of the household, all right? And in the ancient world, in the Roman Empire, at least up until the fourth century, that meant that the father had almost unlimited power in the context of the home. And the extent of that power is going to surprise you. The father in the Roman Empire had almost 
unlimited power in the context of the home. He had the power, and it's worth remembering that in the Roman Empire, the home isn't just like husband, wife, and 2.3 kids. It's everybody who lives on the property. So slaves, servants, children, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whatever. The oldest man, the head of the household, had this power. He had the power of life and death over his children. If one of the children did something that the father believed warranted the most severe discipline, even death, he had the power to do that. There are no child protection services in the Roman Empire. Nobody was going to call DHR. The head of the household had that kind of authority. In the marriage relationship, the head of the household had most of the authority there. There were instances where if a woman inherited property from her father, that that would pass on to her sons and the husband couldn't get control of it. But in general, the power is there. Now when we're reading texts like this, and with the Slaves and Masters piece, I probably don't even have to tell you how much power there is in that situation. It's important to know, in the ancient world, in the Roman Empire, slavery was not a matter of ethnicity. Europeans enslaved Europeans. Romans enslaved the people who lived in Rome. Uh, Ancient philosophers believed that some people, regardless of ethnicity, were just born natural slaves, and if that was the case, it was fine for other people to enslave them. Tremendous percentage of the population in the ancient world was slaves. They had no rights. They were treated poorly. They died in mass graves. Sometimes worked to death. When Paul writes this, he's writing in a genre that was present in the ancient world. You can find secular text with these kinds of codes. Wives do this. Husbands do that. Children do this. Masters do that. And in some ways, it's not surprising. Paul was, after all, a product of the first century. So when he's doing the kinds of things that people in his world did, it's not all that surprising. What is surprising is when he pushes back against the cultural assumptions of the world he lived in. And in this text, there's some very specific places, and you may have already begun to notice them, where he very much pushes back against the cultural assumptions of the world in which he lived. Can you imagine what it might have been like for a, what was it, pater familias? Anybody remember what that means? Father of the family, head of the household. Can you imagine Paul telling the head of a Roman household who has authority of life and death over his children, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Do you think anybody in the Roman Empire in the father space would have thought that's good advice? I mean, after all, if you have power of life and death, you call the shots. You do what I say. If you don't like it, well, some folks' parents used to take them to the woodshed. You'd be relieved if that's all it was if you lived in the Roman Empire because it could be a lot worse. And so Paul takes men in Colossae who assume they have almost unlimited authority over the lives of the people in their homes and says, don't provoke your children. You're not the dictator of your house. Don't embitter them. And he says, when it comes to your wives, don't treat them harshly. 
I guarantee you there were plenty of men in the Roman Empire who thought their right as citizens granted them the privilege of treating their wives harshly if they wanted to. It is a stunning thing to have a letter written by Paul where he challenges that. And we begin to see the extent to which he challenges it when we get to the part about slaves. Because if a slave in your house crossed you, Potter familias. You could do whatever you wanted and pretty much nobody was going to ask any questions. You could throw them out. You could end their life. It's your call. And so for Paul to come and say, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair. Why? Because you have a master in heaven. He is leveling the playing field in a way no one else in the first century was doing. Nobody told the pater familias, you have a master. And so when we bring this whole household code, as it's called, together, keeping in mind that Paul has just told them over all the virtues of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Those are the virtues that he calls on them to embody. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. And he says, over all of these things, 3.14, put on love. And then when he gets to the instructions for the household, we begin to realize... He's calling upon members of Roman households to be ruled by love, not their rights. Isn't that a wild conception? What if a Christian household isn't governed by who has rights? What if it's governed by the question of who embodies the perfect love of Jesus in the spousal relationship. Notice how each each member of the household he addresses is invited to look to the needs of whom? The other person in the counterpart relationship. So wives, look to whom? The husband. Husbands, look to the interests of whom? Wives, children, look to the interests of whom? Somebody else. Your own interests? No. Someone else's, your parents. Fathers, look to the interests of whom? Your children. Slaves, look to the interests of your masters. Masters, pay attention to the interests of your slaves. And no one is invited to look out for number one. Are they? Why? Because Paul expects a Christ-oriented community to embody other-oriented love. And when he gets to the place where he applies that to the household, it means every member shows up saying, I'm not so worried about my rights or my privileges. I'm looking for ways to embody the character of Jesus in relationship to my household. And that's difficult sometimes, isn't it? It's difficult to offer love to the members of our household when we're frustrated. It's difficult to say to our children, I was wrong, isn't it? We'd much rather, even when we know we're wrong, not say to a child, I sinned against you with what I said a little while ago. 
This happened in our home a few days ago. I said something to one of my kids, kind of snarky, insinuating that they weren't doing the things they were supposed to be doing. And about two seconds later, I got into another room and was telling Naomi about it, and she's like, no, actually, they have been doing that. (laughs) And I immediately felt the conviction of the Spirit. And the temptation was there to go, ah, well, whatever. I don't want to go tell my kid that I sinned against them. I'm the dad. I don't want to look weak. I don't want to look small. I don't want to look wrong. (laughs) Do you? But the heart of our children depends on the presence of other-oriented love in their parents. And the necessity to reconcile, to say, I'm sorry with what I said a moment ago, I sinned against you. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Otherwise, we are in danger of embittering our children. Not only against us, but against the gospel we say we love. Doesn't mean there's no discipline in the home. Doesn't mean there's no correction. Does mean it's done with an interest in what's best for the other, not with an interest in me getting my word in because I'm angry. See the difference there? You see what Paul's calling for. Continue in Christ. Above all these things, put on love. Cover all these virtues in love. And friends, Wildly so, it is easier to give people at the office a pass than it is the people who live in our houses, isn't it? It's easier to give strangers a pass than the people who live in our houses, sometimes. We are our true selves with the people we live with. And we are called by God make sure that our true selves embody the self-giving, other-oriented love of Christ. Now Paul expands it. We've talked about households. We've talked about what it looks like for a household to be marked by other-oriented love. What about the church as a whole? Chapter 4, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Now he's talking to everybody. Being watchful and thankful and pray for us. That God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in change. And he goes on to tell them, pray that I can do it clearly. Pray that I can do it boldly as I should. And then you, you, Paul says, this isn't just my ministry. You participate in this with me. You be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Got your little group, you're the church. It's real easy to be the holy huddle. How do you relate to the rest of the world? Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. And he's not talking about just any random conversation. With the next sentence, he says, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And he has in mind those opportunities for the gospel. And he's asking the Colossians, Are you prepared to answer when the question of the Gospel arises? Because a Christ-oriented community will embody other-oriented love, not only in the households, but amongst each other and in the way they relate to the world. And so Paul calls upon them to have a thoroughly prayerful devotion to the advance of the Gospel. The local church is called upon to have a prayerful devotion to the advance of the gospel. That means not only are we praying, Lord, would you create opportunities for the gospel? Lord, would you open the hearts of my neighbors to be receptive to the good news that Christ died for them, that he loves them, that he was raised from the dead, and that he longs to take hold of them and join him to himself and fill their lives with this perfect love. 
And how many times go by, even after I've built some trust with my neighbors, and there's a really good chance the door is open, but I'm just hesitant. After all, the HOA meeting would not be comfortable if this doesn't go well. What if they're not responsive? You don't want to have that between you and your neighbors. And we, we sort of easily come up with all of these justifications for why the gospel shouldn't be at the center of those relationships. Maybe it's in the place where I go to school. Maybe it's in the place where I work. Maybe it's the guys I play golf with. Paul says, pray for the doors to be open to the gospel. Be prayerfully committed to the advance of the gospel. That's what this thing is about. And then when the door opens, be ready to walk through it. Be ready to answer the question. So for Paul, question number one, are we praying for the advance of the gospel? That's really the easy part. (laughs) Number two, are we ready and able to answer the question of the gospel when it arises? You're sitting around on break with somebody at work, maybe having a coffee. Some stuff's been going on in their life. They didn't grow up in church. They know you did, though. Start to ask questions. I know you're committed to the church. That's not my background. What gives? What's the deal? What's that all about? Increasingly, we're around people that have no exposure to what we're doing right now. Even in the Bible Belt. Am I ready in that moment to answer the question? Jesus is everything to me. When I experienced grief, He was near to me. When I felt lost, He drew near to me. He brought me to Himself. When I felt condemned because I had sinned, because my life was marked by things that were just damaging to myself and the people around me, He, he, he offered me acceptance. He forgave me. He, 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 he restored me. He healed me from those things. He, he redeemed me. He's cared for me. He's offered me compassion and hope. Are we ready? His perfect love revealed in His death and His resurrection. He's the one who loved us, gave Himself for us. His blood was shed and His flesh was torn. In my place, and being raised from the dead, with His new life, He shares that. That's why I'm hopeful. That's why I'm there. Are we ready to answer the question or are we ready to change the subject because we're worried about how it might go? Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful and pray for us too that God may open a door for the message. The message is the gospel, the mystery of Christ Christ. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was raised on the third day. He reigns over all things and in Him is life. And He calls for our trust and our obedience. And He longs to make us flourish. It's like 15, 20 seconds, right? I have found over almost 20 years of ministry, that when I ask the question, what is the gospel, I more frequently get fuzzy, vague, unclear answers than I do clear articulations of the good news. Not saying that's anybody, just that's been my experience. 
for going to be able to answer the gospel question when it comes up, brothers and sisters, we got to know the gospel. If you don't know the gospel and aren't confident in answering that question when it comes up, spend 15 minutes this afternoon memorizing the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 15. Take a little time every day to lean into the gospel. Christ died for us. He was raised for us. Through trust in Him, we have life. It is not complicated, but it is the power of God for salvation. And when the church talks about Jesus, and when the church talks about His death and His resurrection, His lordship and His exaltation, He saves people. And when we don't, well, He's still going around saving people, but we may not get the joy of participating in that process with the people around us. This is the calling. This is the responsibility. This is the thing that He has entrusted to His people and doing it, even when it's scary, even when it's intimidating, even when we're not sure how it's going to come out and we might be rejected before it's all over, doing that is the embodiment of Christ-like love. Like committing yourself to the interests of the other in the gospel is exactly what Jesus does on the cross, is it not? And for us to be willing to take up that good news. And it is good news. Even if it might not go well for us. Well, that's what self-giving, other-oriented, Christ-like love looks like. And all of Colossians, in these few verses at the beginning of chapter 4, punctuate the call through the book, through the letter. Reminding the church that if you're going to be a Christ-oriented community, the test of that is whether or not your community embodies other-oriented love. Be wise in the way you act towards those outside the walls of your church. The last section, the greetings with all the names, gives us a glimpse of the possibilities when churches do this. When we are committed as a Christ-oriented community to other-oriented love, we get a glimpse of the possibilities. It comes in the way the list of names crosses some pretty standard barriers in the ancient world. Two massive barriers in the ancient world that divided groups of people. One was ethnicity. You heard Jews and Gentiles, Romans, Greeks, everybody on this side, and the Jews, stunning animosity. They did not get along. They had slurs for each other. They made fun of each other. They sometimes were violent towards each other. Not, they were not in fellowship. There was a strong boundary ethnically across the Roman Empire. And the second one was socioeconomic. If you were elite, you hung out with elites. You didn't hang out with free, poor persons. And you certainly didn't hang out with slaves. You'd keep them around to serve you but it was not a social relationship. Everybody in the ancient world knew who their equal, equals were. And they knew who was above them. And if there was anyone below them, they knew who was below them. In this last couple of paragraphs, both those boundaries get crossed. You may have noticed Paul mentioned specifically the Jews who were his co-workers. And then he goes on to name some more names. The implication is the folks I'm naming now aren't what? They're not Jews. So I got Mark on the one hand, cousin of Barnabas, 
Justus, Aristarchus, these are the people in the community who are Jewish. That's their ethnicity. And then I got Luke, and Nympha, and Archippus. These are the people in the community who are Jews. And the Gospel, by implication, is the one thing in the ancient world that is taking ethnicities which are not only divided but have animosity between each other and it is breaking down the wall of division to quote Ephesians and drawing them together into unity in Jesus nobody else in the ancient world was doing that the gospel was doing it the second barrier we see is broken when we read the name Onesimus Does that one sound familiar to anybody? Of all the names? We've done one pop quiz already. You ready for the second one? In which book of the Bible, I'll even narrow it down, in which book of the New Testament do we read the name Onesimus other than Colossians? Anybody? Philemon. Philemon. That's the one. And in Philemon, we learn what about Onesimus? We learn that he's a slave. So he's in that lower rung of society. It sounds like he maybe robbed his master and took off. Master's name is Philemon. That's who the letter was written to. And Paul and Philemon are, it looks like, peers. They relate to each other. They're partners. Paul considers Philemon a partner in the gospel ministry. If this is not fresh on your mind, you can take about five minutes and read the letter this afternoon after your lunch. It's only one page, very short. Paul says to Philemon, remembering the paterfamilias rule, if your slave... Just knowing what you know this morning, if your slave steals from you and runs away and you're the head of the household, what do you get to do with impunity? The worst. He can kill Onesimus and nobody's going to bat an eye. And Paul writes to him and says, Hey Philemon, while Onesimus has been here, he's become a child to me in the faith. That means he got converted. He's a brother now. He means a world to me. He belongs to Jesus. And now I'm sending him back to you. And I'm sending him back to you so that you can welcome him not as a slave, but as a brother. That's this guy right here. Tychicus is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the Roman Empire. Nowhere does a master welcome a disobedient slave as a brother, as an equal, as a peer. That's the power of the Gospel in an empire that was ultimately concerned with the rights of the head of the household. Not only does it tear down ethnic boundaries and animosity, it takes the ladder of society and casts it away. It says if you've been joined to Jesus and He's been joined to Jesus, Whatever the empire says, you're brothers. And you belong together. And you look out for the interests of the other. That's what we miss if we skip the last little bit. We miss this lovely glimpse of a community in Christ where people who were once enemies have come together in shared mission, prayerfully devoting themselves to the advance of the Gospel. And we are invited, having been joined to the same Jesus, to have the same priority. If we're going to be a Christ-oriented community. At the end of the letter in verse 17, Paul has a word for a guy named Archippus. 
You can go have some fun with these names later on if you want to. Pull it out, try to pronounce them with your kids. As he's sending these final greetings, giving instructions about what to do with the letter after they've read it, verse 17, he says, Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. And if that is not an exclamation point at the end of a letter or a sermon, I don't know what is. Could it be (laughs) that we, like Archippus, are invited to complete the ministry that has been entrusted to us? Whatever it is the Lord has asked you to do, that maybe there's some hesitancy. We don't know Archippus' story. Paul apparently has insight that we don't have. But whatever it is, his instruction is, complete the ministry. Yes, there may be dangers. Yes, there may be hesitancies. Yes, there may be opposition. Yes, there may be fears. Whatever you do, complete the ministry. Look not to yourself. Look to the work before you and to your neighbors and the nations who will benefit from it. What does it mean for us to complete the ministry? To be completely devoted to the ministry the Lord's entrusted to us. Amongst ourselves, with each other, caring for one another with Christ-like love, other-oriented love. Engaging in work as we do, and more so across the metro area. Relating to our partners and seeking new ones so that the nations will know Jesus. That's the mission. And the mission isn't one of the things we do. It's the one thing we do. I would invite you to commit that to memory. Missions is not one of the things we do. It's the one thing we do. We do it locally. We do it globally. We have one thing to do. Paul says to us, as he does Aristarchus, you got one thing. Complete the ministry. So what does it mean What does it look like as we finish working through this letter? As we've heard the commandment, you've received Jesus, now continue in Him. Continue. Stay with Him. Stay in Him. Draw near to Him. It means we remember that drawing near to Jesus, receiving Him the first time is the starting point, not the finish line. It means that continuing in Jesus is essential. It means walking the discipleship. It means worshiping with the church. It means connecting with our group. It means engaging in service for the sake of the Gospel locally and globally. It means remembering that our discipleship is aimed at full maturity. Not mostly, not 50%. Discipleship is not sin management. It is aimed at full maturity. And this requires for Paul, for us, for the Colossians, an aggressive posture against the things in our life that would draw us away from Him. And a surrender to Him so that He can fill us and cover us with His perfect love that then abounds into our households, into our schools, into our workplaces, into our shared life, and into our mission. Why? So that we can complete the ministry that's been entrusted to us. The ministry can only be accomplished by a community thoroughly oriented to Jesus. And a community being oriented to Him in which He reproduces His life and character and it manifests, it's embodied, it's practiced in the form of other-oriented love. The only question is, do we want to be that kind of people? 
Will you pray with me? Almighty God, our Father, we ask now that you renovate our hearts, that you turn our attention away from our rights, our privileges, our entitlements, and turn them to a posture of Christ-like love. A love that's willing to say, I'm worried about you. A love that's willing to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. A love that's willing to say, Christ died for you, and he loves you. He desires to unite you with him in his resurrection. Lord, you have entrusted this ministry to us and called upon us to do this work. But we can't do it if we don't continue in Jesus. Now we know what that means. So give us the grace we need to hate the sin that remains. Give us the grace we need to put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience and be covered up in your perfect love. For your glory, for our good, and for the salvation of this world. Amen. As we sing, perhaps you want to make a fresh offering of yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe there's some place in life that hasn't been offered to him. It's still turned in on the self. But there's a very clear way to offer that to Jesus and in love to those around you. Maybe you need to confess that to him and ask him to come and fill your life with his perfect love. To renovate your heart. Give you the grace to continue in him and do the work he's called us to. And we offer that to him as we stand and sing.